So welcome today to the Construction Podcast, and we have one of my good friends, Mr. Eric Peterson, with us today. Welcome, Eric. Oh, thanks. I really appreciate being here. Yeah, it's great to have you. And, and Eric and I have known each other for a long time, many years. We've, you know, I've admired your work, your firm, you know, what you do in the industry. Is, even when I was a younger guy in the industry, just trying to chase my way up to Eric Peterson, right? Um, so it's great to have you on, Just and it's fun that we have some projects together. I know we're meeting next week on another one. Uh, so with that said, what has always fascinated me about your firm, Eric, is that you not only do residential, but also commercial. Uh, so what do you like to focus on? Well, it's a good question. I mean, it was something that I really had to think through originally when I was putting together the thoughts on, you know, creating a firm. And it, it, my background was both in the luxury residential market, but we had started to do projects that were golf club related. And those projects came through doing homes in golf communities. And I really enjoyed it because, you know, with the homes, you end up doing the house and maybe you're invited once or twice over for a party and then you're pretty much done with them. And you get the photos and that's about it. But with clubs and restaurants and resorts, you, they're public facilities and you could go back there and you see people in them and you can enjoy them in a different way. And they are, allow you to be a little bit more creative on your own terms as well because they hire you as a professional to do what you think is right which is a little different from a custom home, which you're really creating their dream. And I like that aspect of the balance of the two components and uh, just thought it might be a good way to also diversify the firm so that you're not all eggs in one basket, that you, you have sort of this uh, fallback program if any one of those two uh, paths tends to be lower or slower in one year that you could fall back on it in the other year. So. It was a way to be a little bit more sustainable in the business choice, but also to allow for that sort of differences in product type, but it's still all in that luxury world, which I really enjoy. Yeah, and, and that's the best industry to be in. I mean, but the good thing is that, as you mentioned, and I'm always fascinated because any company that's successful, they diversify, right? But even though they're diversified, they still are specialized in each focus, right? And you've done that, you, you know, you're working on the higher end for the commercial side. So how did those leads begin? Because you mentioned that you started here in the residential side, you're doing these nice homes and these nice communities. I know here in Scottsdale, you're doing them on a national level now. Where did that introduction come or how did that really start where you start positioning yourself in that commercial side? So my mentor is Bing Hu and, and you know, we both started at Taliesin Architects and then that led into h &S International. And Taliesin planned a lot of the golf communities in town. They planned, uh, they were the planning firm for Desert Highlands, for Desert Mountain. In the first jobs that we had at HS were to create the product development, you know, products at Desert Mountain and the golf club at some of the initial golf clubs at Desert Mountain. So our initial link into that was working on the Apache Clubhouse and the Chiricahua Clubhouse. And that started to grow a base of you know really great club work. The Apache Clubhouse is really known across the country in the industry as one of the greatest golf clubs for the size and the budget and the management of it. And so from that, uh, the GM at the time, Bob Jones, was uh, really became an icon in the general managers of club world and a lot of the other club managers around the country and locally all relied on his uh, his advice and he started to recommend me the club in the club world the general managers all are linked together they all know each other they all move around from club to club and they call each other for advice and so word of mouth you know certainly in all of the luxury world both on residential as you know and in in the club world is all related to word of mouth and that's golden and if you do right by one they'll continue to use you uh, over and over again and so reputation is huge and making sure that you take care of everybody uh, is really the the best path and uh, from that project and Bob Jones you know giving us great recommendations that brought us into the world of golf club wor work and that from one golf club house that brought in clients and the clients at new clubs would bring in the golf clubs so it just sort of grew organically well I love that you shared that because it, it reminds me you know like 
in the NFL, you have coaches that are kind of recirculated, you know, and they get let go and then they go to another program, but it's a tight network of who knows who. And it's very similar because I was going to ask how it steamrolls where you're doing projects in Park City and, you know, the West Coast and East Coast. And I know even when you and I were speaking eight years ago, nine years ago, you were chasing a project down in Mexico and, you know, in Baja, California down there. And, you know, so it makes sense that you get in, you do a good job, which is part of building a great company, you build that reputation at steamrolls, you're investing in your business. And one of the things you mentioned early on, Eric, is you had spoken about uh, the balance of both and how there is a difference, you know, with residential, although there's a challenge to it, you know, everyone's very different, but the customer is going to have a little bit more input. So on the commercial side, how involved do you get doing the interior design? Because I know in most of your projects on residential, you're working with the designer. Are you doing the design in the commercial world? We tend to look at that, you know, it's more co cohesive to have the whole sort of thought process in, in place for a commercial project. So it sort of depends on the size of the project. It, on a small uh, uh, retail job or a small uh, restaurant, we would probably offer to the client that we could do that all in-house. For an example, we're redoing the Biltmore Hotel right now and they've brought us in on, they have interior designers doing a lot of the spaces, but on Wright's restaurant, they, they just relied on us to take care of the whole thing on its own. So it's just a small restaurant with a patio uh, and our team in-house pulled the whole thing together and did it. Now we don't publicize that or, or put that out there as a, as a specific service because we, we feel like we have really great collaborative relationships with other interior design firms and we don't want to market ourselves as an interior design firm. Uh, but when we can offer that to help our clients who, number one, have a really strict budget and timeline, we have the skills in-house to be able to, to provide that service. And are these different architects in-house that you have hired that assist with that, that have the skills to also venture into the world of interior design? We have a, a few on our staff that are both versed really well in interior design, have worked with interior designers and have an interior designer background that want to be a part of an architecture firm. And I always find that as a really great balance because even when we're working with interior designers, it's great to have that collaborator on our team that speaks their language and helps bring the two together. It's amazing, you know, the more you get involved, you know, with a good architect, a good designer, a good builder, that cohesiveness and just the communication, coordination and eye for things. Everyone brings a different talent, a different mindset, a different background. And I love that you have that diversification just with your own team because that does allow you now to speak the language of the designer. Um, you know, and it's important you said that because I think our business strategies are somewhat the same. You know, people say, Brad, you know, I follow you on, you know, Instagram or wherever they find us. And they always say, well, you do our design, will you do our architecture? I'm like, no, I, I'm strictly the builder. We're going to put you in the hands with, with a, better build, a better architect and a better you know, designer. And part of that's a collaboration. I've seen, yes, maybe in some instances that would allow us to do a full design build. But the strategy behind it, just being open and transparent as well, this would eliminate Eric Peterson across from me right now, right? Or the relationship we have as we have clients and we know you may good, be a good fit or myself that we can refer work. And, and build that good relationship for the client. Yeah, we, we felt the same. It, it, for us to, you know, certainly other architects have gone into the design build and brought on interior designers and tried to capture all of those markets, but it really does separate you from the collaborative nature of working with all these different builders and all these different interior designers. And it puts others more on edge about bringing you in as a collaboration. And as I said before, it's a lot about word of mouth. Realtors bringing us work, interior designers bringing us work, builders bringing us work. And if you suddenly present yourself as a threat to that right. collaborative nature, then you're going to find yourself sort of just out there on your own. And you may be doing all of those pieces, but you're going at it alone. Yeah, it definitely cuts off the arm of that lead generation yes. you know, that comes in. So from your perspective, is there something that excites you more? Do you have more of a passion for commercial or residential? Well, the residential is always going to be sort of that staple. It's really great. I love working with each individual homeowner that comes in. It's a little bit like marriage counseling in some <laughs> cases because you're dealing with both that the personalities of the husband and the wife and, and how that project's going to go forward. It, and that is, there's a excitement in that and creating their dreams. But I really do like the commercial end of it because they hire you for your professional opinion and your professional ability to 
take them into something that they're trying to achieve. And it's a, more of a business deal. They trust you, they give you that responsibility, and they expect you to perform. And it's a little less about sort of that hand-holding through that whole process, and it's more about the trust in the uh, sort of the, the them just letting you come up with what you need to do to get them to where they need to be. And uh, that's that's somewhat pretty exciting. And, and the fact that you're able to go there and uh, be in your space and see it being used after the fact is is very exciting. Well, I think that's the best part. I look back at our commercial projects, any restaurants we've done or multi-use, and to go back and visit it or take clients and say, yeah, well, you know, we did this restaurant. Yes. There's there's a satisfaction there, right, to bring Absolutely. others. But how does a clientele differ? Because you're alluding to this in a way, you know, on the residential side, you know, they're a little bit more emotional, not in a bad way. It's just, you know, this is something very personal to them. Yes. They're looking at every bathroom in a certain detail that means something, whereas on the commercial side, it's not that they don't care about quality, it's not that they don't care about the product, but it's a little more targeted approach. So how have you seen the difference in clientele between the two scopes of work? Yeah, it's definitely between the emotions and the business, right? So I mean, these are business deals that have to meet timelines and budgets uh, on the commercial side, and on the residential side, it's all about emotion, and, and really that, uh, like I said, you know, doing that counseling between the husband and the wife and trying to balance out who wants what and how they're going to come together. I mean, when a, when a client comes into us and tells us, you know, that they're both on the same page and this is going to be <laughs> the easiest project that I'm ever going to do, then my guard goes up even more. But on, on the commercial side, you know, it's really, um, you know, they have a need and they have a budget and a timeline and, and you're there to take care of it. So what's different too on, on the residential side, you, at least for me, you know, it's not as much, uh, timeline's important. I mean, it's very important. We know how homeowners will get antsy if we're not in, and, but there's a lot of reasons why things can be changed and change orders and clients make. Whereas on the commercial side, you're dealing with liquidated damages, LDs, right? That, you know, it's a little bit more stringent. How, has that ever affected you? I mean, when you get in the commercial side, how cautious of you are commitments and timelines you know, at, at some point you're going to hand that off to the builder, but you're still going to have to do consultations, you know, and inspections and, yes. and hand, hold their hand through design. Right. I mean, it's just reality. We need our architects with us. So how often has that, does that come into play or maybe give you any concern when you're working on that commercial? Yeah, that's a definite team approach. I mean, we need to be there for the builder and the builder needs to be there for us. And so we, we go in hand in hand and, and, you know, a lot of it also has to do with the budget, right? You know, we can't, we can't set up a, a failure for the, for the contractor and uh, you know the contractor needs us to hit the targets so that they don't fail so we go into it sort of, you know very different maybe than other architects might do where that it's sort of them against us you know we we come into it knowing that this has to be a success and we honestly talk through what's the budget what's the timeline what can we do for it and and we do it as a team so that at every step of the way through the schematic design phase and the design development phase that we're talking budgets. Like it's it's a tough thing to want to talk about, but hey, are we on target? And let's not fool ourselves and get too far down the road and you know be lying about it. And then all of a sudden you're way over budget. And um, you know there may be opportunities in a custom home where they decide to increase the budget because they really fall in love with something. But on a commercial project, it's a much different story, right? They've got either investors as a part of the team that they're trying to, you know, there's a certain profit margin that needs to be made. You're dealing with huge ownership groups like, you know, the Hyatts and the Hiltons and the Marriott's or whoever it might be. There's no changing schedule and budget. It's It needs to be done. And, you know, we just want to make sure that we set it up for, uh, the best win and make us all look like heroes uh, at the end of it and that then leads to our, the reputation which is why we get hired by by more projects so uh, for us that's the goal that we go in and why we get then brought in on other projects because one development group will hear from another development group that they hit the mark they hit the budget they hit the schedule and now we want that team on on board for us yeah, there's definitely a big difference because, you know, if the house is delayed because the homeowners make different selections, it's not the end of the world. But if a restaurant's delayed, well, every day that it's delayed, that's revenue, right? Yep. They're, they're not 
packing that in while I'm, it's COVID right now. So it's not like they can yes. have 100% occupancy, but there's still cost. Yeah. You know, they're paying every, lease. They're paying, space, yeah, yeah. Lease on the space. There's, you know, investment, as you mentioned. Going back to the budget side, though, you know, it, it, it's always a tough thing trying to figure out a budget. You know, it's like, well, what does it cost for a bag of groceries? I mean, I don't know. It depends what you're putting in there, right? And commercial is very similar. So are you engaging the contractor at the very beginning? How involved are you in setting those budgets? I mean, you do have a good pulse on that because you have so much experience. But how are you gauging the wants and needs of the client in the commercial world to know, yeah, what we're doing here is going to stay on course and stay on budget? Our advice on the matter is really to bring in a builder that's collaborative through the whole process. And, you know, you still get the beauty of a competitive bid because that builder could line item every single uh, component of the of of the bid and get a competitive bid on every line item. So you get three bids in framing and three bids in concrete, three bids in plumbing. But when you have the one builder that you've already established is going to build it, that gives him the the uh, power to negotiate those three bids. If you've got multiple contractors bidding, and they're probably going to be overlap in a lot of the trades, and they're not going to change their number because they know they're giving it out to three different builders and they don't know who has the job yet and so they're not going to go through that uh, process of trying to uh, give this guy one number and that guy another number so once you kind of go through that sort of logic of how the whole process is going to work and you know really just allow one builder to be your team member and help do the give them the power to negotiate for you uh, then, it, then it really sort of makes sense, you know, and then you have that ability to have the knowledge of the construction all the way through the process. And that's been, uh, I think, the saving grace of the type of projects that we do, and it's been the best way to manage the projects going through the whole cycle. And, and then they're able to basically help you through that and say, listen, if we do this in a more efficient way, I could get your price down, and then I could allow you to get that more expensive finish. And it's almost impossible for us to know that, you know, prior to having the builder involved. And uh, really helps us, I think, achieve a much better project at the end. Well, it's funny because in the commercial world, they're a little bit more savvy. I mean, most of the clients have been through this enough and spent enough money right on construction to understand that methodology and, and theory, right? That if, yes. if we bring Eric in and his team at PHX and we have a good reputable builder who's done this, yeah, really, you can negotiate maybe their fee or their timeline. These are going to, you know, how to make that decision. But they have the trust in that organization that they're going to give them good pricing right. and get multiple bids. Whereas the residential side, you know, toward blue in the face, we could educate clients. And some may believe us and some may say, Eric, I want you to design the house and then I'm going to send it out for bids, which, again, and, you know, it doesn't protect you designing the house to know at the end of the day, where's this going to come in at? You know, it's better off still having the builder at the beginning if we can educate the client. Yeah, and we've been lucky enough in the, in the environment that we're in and both the California market and here, most of the builders aren't doing competitive bid. We're all very busy. Everybody doesn't want to take time to be in a competitive bid process. And frankly, most of our work does come through referrals from builders. And so they are a part of the team right from the very start. And so, again, I just have that conversation up front with the clients and explain the value that they get from having the builder as a part of the team from the very start and what the differences are between doing a competitive bid and, frankly, the difference between what how my drawings have to be. You know, if we're going to do a competitive bid, our, our drawings are going to have to be completely detailed to the nth degree because it has to oh, be yes. equal apples to apples when you get that bid back if there's any vagueness in there that just opens up you know a, a spot within the builders to not be able to narrow down that price and uh, they'd have to pay my fee higher in order to get that set at that more detailed level for competitive bid so most of our clients are very educated and smart people that once you kind of walk them through that process they get it right off the bat and i think we've probably done maybe 2% of our projects over the past 18 years in a competitive bid way once we've gone through that process. Well, I love that you shared that insight because I think that's something that the clients miss and it's something that I never even thought about is that, you know, from an architect side, we rely on the details and the scope and everything selected because this allows us to be more competitive in our process. So when I have clients say, 
Brad, well, we kind of know we like, and we don't need a designer. I'm like, hold on. We got to have a designer because it's going to make you like me at the end of the project. You know, there's so much information that they have to digest and interpret and put together for us to competitively bid. You know, if I don't have a designer that's selecting and designing the cabinetry, well, then we're going to be locked in to go into one kitchen and bath showroom. They're going to design the cabinetry and then you're locked into their price. Whereas if the designer does it, well, now I can send it out, as you mentioned, to three cabinet companies. I can get competitive bids. The scope's correct. Yes. You know, there's no guessing game. I can control the cost. I can control the change orders. And then the customers start to understand that. But from an architect side, as you mentioned, well, it's going to be more expensive for them because they have to pay more for your fee because you've got to be more detailed. Any open gaps are going to make it so open-ended. You know, all of us anyways with detailed plans are going to interpret it a different way anyways. So the more um, that we leave it open, the more vague it can get. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that... The, 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 the process, I mean, most of the clients that come from the East Coast are used to something very different. They hire an architect, and then at the end of the process, they put it out to three competitive bids. There's attorneys involved. I mean, it's a whole different method. And if they've done that process before, that they just think that's the normal process here. Uh, but the, but uh, this, the process here is really much more collaborative, much more everybody, it's a looser game. There's not attorneys involved in land sales as there are on the east side. Um, Midwestern clients, which we get more of the Midwest clients here, they're a little bit more open to that. They, this is usually a first time opportunity for them coming here and learning about the process. And once we talk them through what that process is and how easy it is and how much more uh, fun it is to have everybody on board from the start. Uh, it also allows you to get to know your builder as in a more friendly way. I mean, as a team member, uh, early on in the process before you're writing hundred thousand dollar checks to them, you know, day one. And now you've got another team member on help fighting for you in this process than just somebody who just won the lowest bid and now you're, you know, going to start writing five hundred thousand dollar checks to them. And uh, that process, I think, really helps because many of our clients are friends with the builder when they start construction and not just getting to know who they are. I love that you shared that. I think that's really interesting because I look back at my career um, and the successful projects are the ones that I was involved from pre-construction. And yes. as you mentioned, you're building this rapport, you're building this relationship. And so it, there's almost this friendship between the client and builder, as you mentioned, and then through construction, which is a strenuous process, and it's always complicated and it's always difficult. We're dealing with so many components to the house. Um, but it does make that process so much better because that faith and trust has been built for that eight months to a year of pre-construction. Yeah. I mean, we're all together on these two, two and a half years, three years on the complex projects. And in California, it could be, you know, four to five years. That's a long time to be with people. And you, you need to like the people and you need to trust the people. And that's the only way to do it is to have everybody at the table from day one. And having good bedside manner, I guess you could say, you know, from day one works good. So Yes, that's for sure. So talk to us about that because what's interesting, I've seen your, your company. I mean, you've always been successful, Eric, and you've really focused on, you know, the, your market, but you've also looked at growth and you've expanded and you've worked. And, and you and I have had several conversations about you moving to Beverly Hills and working in California. So how has that changed your business model now having a satellite office in Beverly Hills, one here in Scottsdale? Yeah, we looked at that opportunity about four years ago and I wasn't sure exactly um, what I was doing uh, on that at, at first. It was sort of like a leap of faith. And I went out there and I uh, just started doing some exploratory with uh, how I would fit into that market, how do things play out over there, where does work come from, who are the major players, how do we price things. So I was doing that exploratory work and just within that sort of, you know, looking around, things started to pop, things started to happen. I would post something on Facebook and others would chime in and say, this is exciting, let me help you. I could offer you this, I could offer you that, let me introduce you to this person. And, I, and when those things happen, for me, I just feel like it's uh, faith that, you know, some, in some way it's meant to be. And uh, an office space came to be because of a client and, uh, and a job came in because somebody knew me. And 
Uh, and we started meeting with all the A-list in the market, and those relationships started to be built very strong. And when you say A-list, you know, because you're competing against architects, so who are the A-list that you're meeting with? Right. So, you know, there's certainly some unbelievable, you know, star architects in that market, like Landry and McLean and, and Appleton. And so to try to go in as, like, thinking I'm going to be at their level in L.A., was uh, you, you know there was it's a there's a reality check. I knew what I was getting myself into, but so then there's the A list on the interior designers, the builders, the landscape architects. So I saw my opportunity in that market to go in and meet with that A list level, and I did that by hiring a really great PR firm that was trusted in that market. And because with her being able to make the phone calls to them and say, this is somebody you need to meet, I would get a meeting. Otherwise, there was no way I'd, I'd have anybody's time of day. And then developing those relationships by them seeing me there often, being a part of this, the social scene in L.A., being a trusted member of the inner circle, and just allowing them to say, you know, give me a chance. I'd love to help you on a project. If you, you're the interior designer on this project and it's just a small little project and you don't know who else to ask, bring it to me. I'll let you take the lead. I just want to build a relationship. In that sort of like, um, you know, very sort of honest way of just saying, give me an opportunity, really goes a long way. People like that. They like to be the person that helps out the new kid on the block. And through that um, just honest ask, uh, I was very surprised that a number of them have stepped up to the plate and made great introductions. And in then meeting a lot of the, the, the A-list architects in town as well, that's how they got their opportunities as well. It only takes one introduction to one you know, client that leads to that next you know, client that suddenly you're like doing Oprah's house, right? You know, and then yeah. you're on the cover of Art Digest and, the, and your story's ended. You know, like, you're done. You're you're like set for life. So, it's just those small little things that just kind of build your career. And and now we've been there three years, and we've had awesome opportunities, and it continues to grow. And you know, with this year, it's unfortunate we've had a little setback because of the COVID lockdown. And LA have certainly been locked down more than almost any other state. So every uh, design related event that they have throughout the whole year has been closed and. We've uh, really been unable to have the opportunity to, to socially network with the group that we typically do. Uh, but we've all stayed in touch via Zoom, and I still travel over there uh, every other week uh, to have client meetings. And we do have a number of projects that are moving forward. And, uh, and I think it's going to be very strong as we look towards next year. That's exciting. And, that, and I'll say one thing. I, I totally agree. I think... Uh, I shouldn't say I think. I, I really believe that small things lead to big things. Yes. But what you mentioned was, I mean, there's still, for these small things that happen, you know, you're pounding the pavement. You're making an effort. Yes. And one thing that I'll get, I'll commend you for is that when we're, we're we have a project together in Troon. And from the very beginning, when we were meeting with the client and you had brought us in and you're like, okay, Brad and client, we need to have our landscape architect. We need to have our designer. So right away, you're putting the team together for the client, which is going to make the project successful. And in essence, you're doing that in California. You're going there, you meet with the landscape architects and the builders and the designers, and you're starting to build this network, which is super key. And what fascinated me, I remember you telling me at a networking event we're at, you said, hey, Brad, I was watching, um, what's the name of that show? It was on Netflix. It was the realtor show. Oh, Selling Sunset. Yeah, Selling Sunset. So you're watching Selling Sunset, and they're showing a developer. They're showing a sign. Then you go on Google Maps. You look it up. You figure out the, who the developer was. You figure out the address. You go on the county records and figure out the permit. And then you contact them, right? Yeah. And so... It's with, research. It's you know, research. Like, so it's not just like, hey, I'm Eric Peterson waving my flag. Come hire me. There's actually a targeted approach to even selling Sunset. You're watching something on your own time, still making the effort to now go build that name and reputation. Yeah, like Million Dollar Listings, Selling Sunset, all of these shows are, you know, have opened up sort of a way of understanding who the major players are, what, how business is being done there, you know, and of course it's still a reality show and there's, there's that level of, uh, sort of fakeness to it, but, but there's still these projects and there's still these developers and these are the builders and <clears throat> they're certainly the big players in the market and knowing what they're doing and how they're doing it is, uh, sort of research for my business development. 
I love that you share that. And it, it just shows that, you know, things that don't happen. People don't just don't come to your company and, and hand over a project, right? There's relationships that are built. So from your lead generation, I know you've been very active in social media uh, on all the platforms. And I know Shay, who's, who's with us, she's a big part of that. So what is, is, is there a certain platform that you feel has been more beneficial? How have you seen social media play an impact in your company growth? Well, it certainly started in Facebook, for sure. And then as Instagram sort of came on the scene, it just shot past it. And so really right now, uh, you know, on, my, on the personal side, I've developed a pretty good following on my Facebook page, but the Instagram account is really our key marketing component. And, at, and as we've moved into the LA market, we've seen that even more so. Uh, almost every designer in the LA market has a very uh, big um, lead on in the Instagram page uh, revenue component where they are posting at a brand that people are beginning to follow and they're finding a lot of their, their clients through people who are just following them on, on Instagram. Uh, there's a little bit through uh, the uh, site called House, and they uh, they also develop some branding and, and marketing efforts, but pretty much across the board, the Instagram is where we're looking at the most growth opportunity. And have you? Wh why do you think that is that in California you're seeing that the designers there have a bigger footprint on Instagram? I feel like Arizona is starting to. Some of our designers have really taken yes. off, but even some of the really well-known designers don't spend a lot of time on social media. They're not prevalent on there. Right. It, I, we're still trying to figure the whole thing out. I was surprised how much, as I started to meet the, the groups in L.A., um, where that influence was coming from. And it certainly does have to come in through uh, magazines. You know, magazines have a presence, Art Digest and such, and they are relying on who they are putting in their magazines based on who are the influencers and the followers. And the best way to find out who people are watching and listening to is through Instagram and seeing you know, who has the biggest followers if you've got over 10,000 or 20,000 or 100,000 or a million. Um, you know, I, I had lunch last year with Martin Lawrence Ballard, and, you know, he has got one unbelievable career in uh, doing famous people's houses over the years. And he had told me that it didn't happen until he was on the cover of Art Digest with the Kardashians that he, like, skyrocketed to another atmosphere and you'd think like when you're doing like he's done Elton John's house and Madonna's house and people like that that that's you've done it you've hit it really hard but you know even Art Digest said that issue with that cover on their social media with the Kardashians was the highest that they'd ever achieved and those that's how we're being rated these days that's how Art Digest determines who's going to be in their pages not because it, the design is might not, not be the best design, but they're going to get the more, most number of followers or the most number of hits based on the fact that they've used those those people. So that's a very different way of thinking through how you coin success. You know, not because it's the best design, because it might have gotten the most viral hits. Well, it's interesting you share, share that because I think, you know, there are a lot of people that are true craftsmen, right? Whether they're builders or architects that, you know, may take a little offense to that, that I'm talented, but I'm not getting to that level. But the reality is, you know, these, everyone has to pivot, you know, economies change, markets change, businesses change, especially as we've seen in the last year. And so the companies that get it. So, you know, when you look at print media, as you mentioned, Lux Magazine and Ar Architectural Digest, you know, they've really taken off on social media. Because print media, it's not that a lot of us aren't still doing print media, but it's changed. They've had to change their demographic. And from what is what it is, Kardashians, pop culture, right? That's going to hit a different audience, a different demographic. And so if you're an architect, yeah, you work with an influencer, you work with a blogger that's very successful. You know, I've seen that in our business. You, you know, there is an investment from you or me that maybe they may come and say, okay, Eric, if you're going to design my house, I want a discount, which... They're probably going to ask for, but at the same time, that reciprocation and exposure can help catapult things as well. Yeah, when uh, when somebody gets your name, they want to find out, they want to verify you to find out, are you somebody that they should really be talking to? Especially in California, I'm exactly. Sure. <laughs> and and the 
number one way that they're doing that these days, it's not going to your website. It's seeing if you have an Instagram page and how many followers you have. And that becomes verification. And in some levels, you know, I've definitely seen super high-end design operations, be it architects or, or, or interior designers, go completely away from that and say, I want zero presence. I don't want, like, I'm underground. And, and they, they believe that that is, they're, they're proud of that. You know, like, we're so good that you can't even find us. I don't have a web page. I don't advertise. You can't, I don't have an Instagram account. And then there's the other side of that where they're really targeting to get, you know, they want the most number of followers and they want a, 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 a real big uh, influence on that, that social media component. So, you know, it's interesting to sort of play that out and see because I do believe that there is some level of that, um, oh, my architect is, you know, super famous. Look at all the followers he has and he's posted everywhere. And there's the other side that's like, oh, yeah, he's so famous that, like, you don't, you, you can't don't even find him. Yeah, yeah, he's so secretive and, you know, he only does the elite and it's completely private. Well, it's interesting you say that, you know, as much as I've looked into marketing over the last few years, they, you know, as social media has increased, you know, everyone has a smartphone. I mean, all of us do here. You go around, people are on their phone all the time. That's how they're researching things. So if you don't have a presence, you may have a reputation that's built that, as you alluded to, you know, that can carry you. But at some point, you know, that, that pivot or, or that pendulum does swing, right? You yes. have to have some presence because all the research shows that most people, when they're looking at a company, if they're looking at PHX, they are going to go on social media. Yes. They're going to say, well, what's his aesthetic? What are projects he's done? And you can showcase that. It's, an, it's a working resume. And, you know, there are studies that companies that grow, it's, you know, that have consistent growth is because they have a better social media presence than their competitors, yes. right? So they're just seeing that. And it's, even if you don't have a ton of followers, I've seen where even if, you know, I'm working with a client right now and she said, okay, Brad, I need a recommendation for a designer. So I give her a few and right away she goes Instagram. Like, what's their Instagram handle? Because she wants to see their aesthetic and what's their design. Is this what I'm looking for? Does it make me feel right? And so even if they have 2,000 followers or 20, it doesn't matter but are they showcasing the style that she wants? Yes. The, the other difficult in that is the more we get into doing um, clients that have privacy and don't want their homes to be utilized, you know, so some architects and designers who are just doing those types of homes for the very rich and, and private and movie stars, there's already confidentiality built into that and you can't use any of the photography in any social media or your website. And so then you start to build to the level, but then you can't use it anymore. And, uh, you know, that's certainly where we're getting into that moment now where I do have, you know, clients that have asked me to be private and not share their work. And it's, and then you're kind of like, oh my gosh, this is the best work I've ever done, you know, and I can't put it out there to show. And, uh, you know, so then you really are relying on word of mouth on those because those clients certainly have friends that you'd want to do houses for and you rely on them because you can't use their, their f uh, photos of the work that you've done. So have you put anything in your contract to that language to say, hey, we need to have the yeah. ability to photograph and market your project? Yeah, so that's really one of the number one things. That's really a main thing that we choose a project for when a client comes in that we tell them that, is a requirement and that starts right off the bat the conversation leading to well okay if you're going to have a problem with that then we might have to come up with something different and you know one one might be that we may have to charge more for the house because if we can't if we're going to go through all this trouble and we're going to do this house and we can't Market. use any of the photos from it at all um, then you know we really have to think about why we're going to do that project and you know is there a, a end to the means of you know going through the all of these years of work and not having something to show for it in the end yeah it's interesting we've had for the most part our clients have been pretty good understanding about social media but i've had a few pushback and i had a couple that were very adamant brad we don't want you to photograph the house and do stories and all the social right. media content um, but as we talked through that, they said, well, but at the same token, the reason we found you was because of yes. the social media. So they understand the means to an end there. And, but they're still very particular how we use their content. So even though it's in our contract as well, and we have that discussion, sometimes we will, uh, redline that a little bit and say, well, 
all the photos or stories that I'm going to post, I'll have you verify or confirm they're okay first because we have one client that said people are going to know the settings, so I want to be particular on the backdrop and the scenery, maybe no family pictures on there, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. So it's just more of a targeted you know, relationship. Okay, Eric, here's what we're going to do. Are you okay with that? Yeah, we've, got, we've gotten the same. And a lot of times we'll get the rights to use photos in our office. So we could show them to new prospective clients if they just can't be in, published, published in, in on social media. Yeah, which is tough. So how do you manage, you know, opening your other office? And we spoke about just the lead generation, how you started building your reputation there. The complexity of running a company now from afar, even though you're going there as often as you can, but California is a difficult place to travel as of late. So how do you manage the training, the day-to-day -day at a satellite office? Yeah, so when we started doing that, I really didn't have that thought thought out. And again, the the pieces all fell together. So during the recession, we had lost you know over half of our firm, and they sort of all went in different locations. And as I started to pursue opening an office in Los Angeles, I still wasn't sure exactly how I was going to staff it and how that might all work. And one of my very first employees and and somebody who I was um, who was really somebody who worked with us for quite a long time up until the recession, who I trusted empirically, contacted me, again, probably saw it on Facebook and said, are you opening an office in LA? I live in LA now and I'd love to come back and work for you. So instantly I had somebody who was really like family, knew how I work, knew what our firm did and was going to be working out of that office. And uh, the second employee came to us and was again somebody I knew through Taliesin and had been over there and integrated into the market and was a friend and, and an acquaintance and, and a talented architect. And so the people that I had put into that office weren't brand new people. They were people I had already had relationships with, already had worked with in the past and trusted like a brother. And so they were able to just sort of integrate in and start working, you know, immediately and uh, with all the trust in the world of who you know our reputation was and how we work. And that was really, I think, the key to being able to do something like this without a whole lot of heartache of you know feeling like I had to watch over them every single second. It's so hard because the company culture, the reputation, yes. you know, your methodology, your systems, you know, these are things that take time. Even on yes. a new hire, you invest a lot of time to train them and the, the PHX way, right? And so, but the advantage of opening a satellite office, now you have people that are in that market yes. that have worked for you, and so it gives you a quick head start. Yeah. So how many employees do you have here in Scottsdale and how many are in California? Yeah, 27 in Scottsdale, three in California. So how do you manage all those personalities? Well, a lot of it happens uh, by other people. So uh, one of my principals that manages our entire staff, Ron Skoog, he's been with me for quite a, a long time, and he really... Uh, is great at managing. He loves to manage. He he, uh, he loves to put charts and, and schedules together and know where who's working for who. And we meet every single week with our our project managers, and we go through the schedule of every project and what staff support they need. And he helps manage all of that. And uh, my wife, Kimberly, she is part of the office management staff, and so she handles human resources and all of the front office staff, our accounting staff. And uh, so that helps me so that, well, I'm out of the office quite a bit and really managing my clients. Uh, she's able to be there for our office staff and really make sure that everything's sort of running smoothly on the home front. See, that's amazing because I look at my firm and, you know, we've grown, we're at 14, so you're double the size, you're more than double of us. You know, managing people and personalities and, you know, all the complexity that goes with a, a business of that size. So how is that broken out, the hierarchy, I should say? You know, you as the owner doing a lot of the business development and marketing, you know, taking that arm. You know, when you use the term project manager, you know, are they responsible? Are they drawing themselves? Are they managing a team? You know, how is that broken out? Yeah, all of the above. So I'm, I'm mostly in client meetings and traveling. I've got two really key staff members that are uh, that have been with us a long time, one in California and one in Arizona, Stuart and Claudio, who are our design uh, our lead design architects. and they have been with me so long that they, you know, we complete each other's sentences. And so they know what I'm looking for and what uh, the look of our firm is. and 
I might kick off the project and come up with where I think the concept needs to go and then I pass it off to each of them and then they develop it to the next level and every day we're in constant communication where they're showing me where they're at, I'm uh, uh, helping edit it and then they take it to the next level. So they're sort of my hands that where I'm not able to actually sit and draw all day long at a, at a desk because I'm moving from mm -hmm. meeting to meeting. And then my project architects are are managing all of the consultants and doing all the AutoCAD and Revit drawings and pulling the drawings up to the next level as well. So it's really a fine-tuned machine at this point where, you know, this is we're going into our 19th year here, coming up on a 20-year anniversary it's next exciting. year, which will be really great. And we've really gotten that to that point where everybody's sort of doing their part in making it all come together. So how do you keep it motivated when you have 27 people and you have so many projects and you do have some amazing projects, which I'm sure excites them, but how do you keep that culture, uh, you know, motivated and excited and amped up for, for the vision that you have? So one of them is constantly uh, moving the dial, right? Like getting better and better projects. So to, for us to, uh, bring in the types of projects that we do, the clientele and the and the level of projects that we do certainly gets them excited because you know they're the types of work that they wouldn't have an opportunity to work on, let's say, at other firms. So the the level of clientele, the types of projects is part of the reason why we moved into the Beverly Hills market, because it does elevate us to a, another level. The type of golf clubs and resorts that we're able to work on now certainly motivates people. We're doing the Biltmore Resort. And, you know, that's an iconic, historic, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright apprentice inspired project that is one of the, you know, key buildings in the city of Phoenix and all of Arizona. And that motivates people, that gets people excited to be a part of a project that has so much breadth to it. And, you know, even the projects that we're doing in LA are super exciting projects, the golf clubs that we do. Uh, the press that we get on all, all of our projects, they get excited to see our our, uh, our, our uh, projects on the cover of magazines and, and I mean, Shay is really reporting to us every single month, uh, every magazine that we're being featured in, that's, that's excitement in the sense of pride that our, our employees get. And we're constantly submitting for awards. And many of the awards have been local, but now that we've expanded into a more national scene, we're getting national awards. And last year we even got an international award for a house that we did. So all of those things really cr create pride within our staff and excitement that they get a chance to work on this type of project. And then we also motivate at a different level, which is sort of just in a family way of like all of us being together. And every month we have staff meetings where we completely go through and talk about everything we're doing. So even the intern in our office has a really good understanding of all the work that we're doing and and all the different ways that we're touching you know our profession and we do lunch together and that's one thing that COVID's really sort of impacted is we're, we're able to we only do these over zoom now and we're not able to sit and have lunch together like we used to and we're really looking forward to doing that and then every quarter we do a team building event, you know, and one of them is related around a charity and the other is just sort of just pure fun. So we'll do something like go to Top Golf for an afternoon and just all bond and be together. Or we'll partake in, you know, uh, a charity event where we're, um, you know, building a, a home, you know, for the homeless or some aspect of that's still architecturally based, but is charitable and team building. You know, I love everything you shared because what I found is most successful companies, as I speak with business owners, they always have uh, opportunities that they seek to be, get, to be together as a team, right? You as the owner, Eric, you're out and you're excited. You're chasing some of these signature projects, commercial and residential, so that excitement's there. Yes. And by passing that on every week at your weekly meeting, well, it helps them see the vision that, hey, I'm not just complacent here. Eric's building this enterprise, I better keep up, I better be up to speed, continue education and research on my own time so I can know what's up and coming, you know, so they can be an ass assistant to you when it comes to that, but also the the team building, the lunches, I mean, we do that too, lunches, because it's yes. just the camaraderie, I love that part, you know, and I, I think one of the benefits that you have too, having a such a large team, is because people, not only do they want to take pride in their work when they come to work, but they want to feel appreciated, and also have opportunities to grow, whether it be 
you know, they can escalate to now be a project manager and run their own little team or move up or maybe part ownership one day. And I'm not sure how that complexity works with your firm because every firm is different, but at least there's opportunity for them to do yes. so. Yeah, for sure. And we meet with every one of our employees and find out what their goals are in their profession. And we work towards those, you know, and some of those goals might be that they eventually leave our firm to go get another experience because we don't do museums and libraries and schools and mm -hmm. And some, uh, you know, really feel like that might be an important piece of their professional career to, to achieve. And so we build them up to the, to the point where then they kind of have their wings and they can fly on to the next. And we've also gotten employees back that have gone and done that and said, you know what, we did it. We didn't enjoy it as much and now we want to come back and, and do what, what we did with you. So I feel really proud. I mean, over the years, we've we've had some unbelievable people come through and we've built them up and we've given them the wings to then go on and, and do their own thing. And that, I think, is what's really important about a strong architectural community is to be able to have these mentoring firms that give that stepping stone to uh, to our profession and and really flourish careers within of really great architects within our community and and there's other firms like Gensler who decided a different method they said we're just gonna constantly keep growing and building and never let our employees go on somewhere else and that's how you get to be the biggest firm in the world you know with thousands and thousands of employees our model is really to stay at 30 employees and so when you have 30 and that's the limit, you're gonna have people move up through that and you know reach a point where then they need to leave because there isn't a, a spot that allows for them to move into that next position because it's filled at that moment. And, uh, and it, But it does create a really great environment because we, we do have our long-term people who've been with us you know, over 10 years that really create the the, the look and the brand and the culture, and then we are able to mentor these other uh, uh, careers up through the process as well. Well, it's amazing because, as you mentioned, you know, certain architects that are working for you, when they go out on their own, they don't realize the complexity of running their own business. You know, it's one thing to draw or design and be creative, but now business development and cash flow and yes. timing and all Accounting. the things that go to account. Human resources. Human resources and management and people yes. and then dealing with the contractors and the designers. I mean, there's so many things you're dealing with and they may not realize that and say, yeah, Eric, I think my gig was better when I was working with you. Well, it tends to take you away from what you really love to do. So mm -hmm. if you love to just sit and draw and and there's create. that, yeah, create. It, it, running your own business certainly removes over maybe 75% of your time into the business aspect. You're, you're bringing in work, you're managing your staff. None of that stuff is stuff that is architecture related. It's all other things. And uh, that tends to be, there, there's sort of that charm and that excitement about, oh, I'm gonna go out on my own, I can do it all my way. But, but then it gets quickly hit, you know, and clouded with all of these other things that aren't architecture that you need to do. And uh, it, it does impact your ability to uh, do the things that you really wanted to do. And what I appreciate about you, Eric, and the architectural industry, at least here in Phoenix, I know that we were out in Miami, we were there at the Lux event right before COVID happened, and we go to dinner with Mark Candelaria and yourself. And... You know, fellow architect, competitor, but at the same time, there's collaboration, you know, there's a respect for each other, you know, so how often when you speak of mentorship and you mentioned that you have networked with some of the big architecture firms in California, you know, how tight-knit is that community to share information, pricing, complexity, issues with clients or builders, you know, all those things that we deal with, you know, to almost have another fellow psychiatrist as a fellow architect to share some of that with. Yeah, it, it, well, it's actually very important. And, you know, Bing Hu, who was my mentor, has been somebody sort of very influential in my life and is always available to, you know, if I run into a situation, I can always call him up and and, and he'd always offer me uh, advice. Uh, even within our very tight-knit community of architects here, I could certainly always call up people like Mark or, or others that, you know, and just say, hey, you know, there's a you know, uh, a situation going on, I, I just need your support or your help in that. And the AIA has also been really good, American Institute of Architects, in sort of helping create a culture of architects. But they tend to stop it at a certain point where they're like, well, you can't talk about prices, you can't talk about this or that. 
And so there's other really great networks. The, there's a national network called the Design Leadership Network, and I have been honored to be admitted into that. I'm the only architect in Arizona that is uh, representing our state, uh, but it's very big in California and across the country, New York. And it's got really the top niche architects and interior designers um, uh, in the country that are a part of it. And that group is really meant for the, that type of mentorship and leadership component where we get together in small groups, very confidential, and we talk through any problems that we're having. And they get together maybe once or twice a year, but then they also have breakout groups that you can join. And that has been immensely helpful to me because you, you're sitting at the table with you know, icons in the industry and they bring up a problem that, you're, that they're having that you're also having. And you're like, how could they be having that problem? I'm having that problem. And it just puts it all into reality that they're just as real as you are and they're having the same problems that you're having. And you talk through, you know, it, not in a, in a way, it's very safe environment. We all say, you know, don't tell them, well, I did it this way, so you should do it that way. It's all put up in a very sort of safe way of saying, we went through it this way and it helped us in this way. And maybe it, that might be beneficial for you to know. And, and in that capacity, it's just a great environment to be a part of, you know, all of these great leaders in the industry and kind of work through the problems in a in sort of a psychological way together. I love that you shared that because I, I feel like one of the pivots and Rod Collum, who you know, so yes. what's we'll awesome about Rod, he pulled me aside a few years ago and he said, Brad, one piece of advice is he was put in like a Builder 20 group, which is similar. And he said it changed his career and he's like, Brad, one piece of advice for you because I, you know, believe in what you're doing and want you to be successful, which is really nice because, I mean, he's not really a competitor, but in essence, he kind of is. But, uh, you know, he said, get in a Builder 20 group and, and that changed really our company, you know, being able to network and share financials and pricing and issues that we're having and legal things and documents and payroll and all these things that we all deal with. Well, now it accelerates that education. It, it's, it's someone there, a resource of people that have been doing this for 40, 50 years. They could say, hey, Brad, don't do it this way. I've learned, learned that's, from my mistake. That's right. And, and it's just, it's so advantageous. And I feel like our company just really uh, you know, took a took a big lift once we had that education a couple of years ago. Yeah, the best thing to know is that you don't have to go this alone. There's other people out there. You know, if you just go think that everybody's out there to stab you in the back, that's just the the worst way to 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 go into a business venture. There's all these great relationships out there. There's all these people that have been through the same situations, and they want to be able to help out other business owners. And there's all sorts of different groups that leadership groups and. Uh, 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 architect groups, business developer groups that would uh, that I think you should seek out to uh, you know whatever one is the right fit for you to help you sort of get through that because we all need that we all need that support. Yeah, and it's just the the mentality. It's a mentality of abundance, not of scarcity. Right? right. There's a lot of work out there, and there's opportunity. And then collaboration is yeah, just going to lift everyone absolutely. and educate them. So what's next and upcoming and very exciting for PHX? Well, uh, you know, this year was a really crazy year. I mean, we saw at the beginning of the year probably being one of our most exciting and successful years and then instantly going into complete lockdown and, and every project sort of going on hold to going immediately back into probably one of the busiest years again that we've ever had, which was completely unpredicted, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic that we'd be in a situation that uh, would have so much work coming out of it. Uh, but we're continuing to expand into uh, different markets. I think all of the more resort markets, Jackson Hole and Whitefish, Montana, Tahoe, Park City, have taken a boom over this last year that, that nobody ever saw coming. They'd sort of been sort of sleepy growth over the years, but this year, all of those markets had the biggest growth that they've ever had. And we're properly placed in, in right now to do projects in all of those locations. And uh, we're currently working on a number of projects and developing relationships in those markets. And so I'm really excited about moving into doing more work in those more resort markets. And we've probably got the most number of golf club projects that we've ever had in the history moving forward uh, in, you know, from Texas through California. 
and uh, we'll, next month we'll launch the Biltmore Resort, reimagined, and and uh, that'll be uh, a really major uh, piece for us in our, in the history of our firm, and for me personally, being you know so attached to sort of the Frank Lloyd Wright legacy, and now to have uh, a project that'll forever be tied together with him in in our local market is uh, really exciting, and we're certainly looking forward to our 20 year anniversary next year, and. Uh, being out of the pandemic and being able to throw a huge party and bring everybody together. Well, that's exciting. And I think you uh, hit the nail on the head by seeking after golf clubs because the interesting thing, I don't know if it's anyone working from home, but since COVID, every golf course is packed and you can't get a tee time yes. ever. I mean, it's amazing. Nobody would have thought no, that that the, the savior of the golf industry <laughs> was going to be COVID. But. And all of them. I mean, it's every course everywhere. They're packed all the yeah. time. So, And I'm sure now they're looking at expansion and yes. fixing the clubhouse. Well, because it's become an expansion of their home. Yeah. And if people were going to be sort of locked into their home, I mean, they what? saw their golf course, their club, as that other part of their home and uh, that just and now they saw that there was a need to revitalize those facilities into something that was more feeling like their home and and so that's been an exciting outcome of this well that's exciting well where can our listeners find you Eric well we our website is uh, uh, www.phxarch.com and our handle on Instagram is at phxarch very consistent. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much. My pleasure to be here.